Uh, you know, our intention wasn't necessarily to scare the hell out of everyone today, uh, but it seems to be that is uh, an unintended consequence of living in Donald Trump's America. Our next speaker is Dr. Harry Targ, a political scientist um, from Purdue University. Thankfully, we have had a very stable genius in charge of our government, and I'm sure he's done nothing to antagonize other countries during this first year. Dr. Targ. Hi, I speak for the Committee of, on Peace Studies at Purdue University and also a Greater Lafayette Progressives, which has a table with some literature on Korea and the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism. I'd like to speak uh, in very few minutes uh, about one, uh, the Trump foreign policy moves over the last several months. Secondly, the international context in which the uh, Trump foreign policy presents to us some enormous uh, dangers. If I have a, a minute or two to say something about Korea and then end with the discussion of the peace and justice social agenda that we need to embrace. In terms of uh, really the last several months in reference to foreign policy, the Trump administration, I think within the last two weeks, issued a national security strategy statement. Every president has to list it. And this recent document uh, emphasizes homeland security, including borders, the fight against terrorism, uh, increasing a layered uh, nuclear missile defense system. And the general thrust of the whole document was to promote uh, the idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, this document is not too different from prior administrations, but nevertheless, it emphasizes war and war making and de emphasizes diplomacy and peace. Recently, the Trump administration announced or leaked information about the maintenance of a permanent U.S. military presence in Syria. In addition, within the last two weeks, uh, President Trump made reference to the whole continent of Africa and Haiti using a pejorative term that I can't mention in the church. Um, uh, also, the Trump administration has threatened to abandon the nuclear treaty with Iran. The Trump administration continues to support the brutal Saudi bombing of Yemen at great cost to the people of Yemen. Uh, the Trump administration announced recently that the U.S. would be moving its embassy uh, to Jerusalem uh, in opposition to almost universal condemnation. The Trump administration, again, also with the la within the last two or three weeks, has announced its ending protective status for Salvadorans who fled the Salvadoran civil war that the U.S. Uh, bankrolled in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, the Trump administration has continued and escalated threats against North Korea. I'll say a bit more about that momentarily. The Trump administration has signed off on a new defense budget that's the highest in U.S. history, uh, $700 billion plus in DOD expenditures. That doesn't include Department of Energy and other costs as well, including providing support for a new round of nuclear weapons development. Uh, the Trump administration, as was mentioned, withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement. The Trump administration has uh, reversed the uh, effort to normalize relations with Cuba, has sought to diplomatically and covertly undermine and overthrow the government of Venezuela. Uh, the Trump administration has continued this process of destabilization and undermining other uh, regimes in Latin America affiliated with the so-called Bolivarian Revolution. And the Trump administration has sent mixed ceilings from virtually on a daily basis uh, as to whether relations with Russia and China should improve or not. I was intrigued moving to the sort of contextual element, and much of this is Trump policy, continuing policies, frankly, of prior administrations. A University of Wisconsin historian, uh, Alfred McCoy, recently published a book with the title, In the Shadows of the American Empire, The Rise and Decline of U.S. Global Power. And I think this is an important element in understanding the 21st century global context. 
In the McCoy book, there's in-depth database analysis of the relative increase in the economic capabilities of other nations, particularly China, but also India and other nations in the global system, and the relative economic decline of the United States. The Chinese have been most active in increasing network and developing an economic presence, not only in Africa and Latin America, but in Europe as well, including developing high-speed rail networks from Europe to the Chinese mainland. And the Chinese have been engaged in developing economic international government organizations involving uh, countries from Asia and European countries that participated it as well. From an economic point of view, we're shifting from a unidimensional or unipolar wor polar world to a multipolar world. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. On the other hand, McCoy documents that the United States' response to this significant shift from unipolarity and U.S. hegemony to a multipolar world has increased uh, commitment to the development of new sophisticated military technologies from uh, combating uh, or uh, increasing our capacity to uh, fight cyberspace wars, to space conquest, to develop a new round of nuclear weapons capabilities, and this on top of an already existing situation in which the United States has about a thousand military installations bases, based all around the world, including uh, opened up since 2008, AFRICOM in the U.S. military presence on the African continent, subversive activities, as I said, in Latin America, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, and the increased reliance on private armies to serve instead of boots on the ground of citizen soldiers. Of course, this is all exacerbated by the dramatic increase in the use of drone warfare to target alleged uh, enemies. And one of the things in the National Security Strategy document is the proposal that the U.S. will uh, identify and target potential threats to the United States. So it continues that tradition that goes all the way back at least to Bush of preemptive war. That is, if we see individuals, groups, or nations that we think might in fact in the future be a threat to us, we have the right, we, uh, we announce the right uh, to engage in military operations to take them out. In short, declining economic power and rising military power with a new executive leadership whose experience is limited and is predominantly military increases the danger of world war. We could talk at length about Korea and at the table of the Greater Lafayette Progressives. There's some literature and a fact sheet on the prospects of war in Korea. Uh, we need to note that the Korean War, which began in 1950, never ended. We need to note that uh, between 1950 and 1953, 20 percent of the population of North Korea was killed. Devastation of their entire uh, infrastructure. We need to note that from the North Korean lens, they see the only security against a resumption of that kind of violence is, uh, is them accumula accumulating nuclear weapons. We need to note that the U.S. continues as an increased military presence uh, in Korea, established a new uh, mil missile defense system in South Korea, and runs with the South Korean government these uh, military exercises uh, on an annual and sub-annual basis, so that the threat in Korea uh, is real. And what this has called up in my mind is a remembrance of something that I lost since forgot, that the existence and spread of nuclear weapons and their potential use and the potential for accidental nuclear war still remains great. And many of us who've been in the peace movement sort of forgot that with all the individual issues that we've had to address. Consequently, what should be the peace and justice agenda? And I would argue that we need to incorporate, along with all these other issues, uh, a peace agenda. We need, one, fight against a U.S. aggressive policy uh, as the United States hegemonic power declines. We have to figure out a way to 
help the United States leadership and even our own consciousness adjust to the fact that we are no longer the hegemonic power in the world and we need to learn to live with other people and nation all across the face of the globe. The, the campaign slogan for this is diplomacy, not war. That makes it more simple and, and doable. Diplomacy, not war. Second, we, we have to address the problem of military spending. Because the more we spend in the military, the less we spend on everything else that we'll be talk, have been and will be talking about today. And cutting military spending goes beyond just calls for reducing spending, but figure out mechanisms and policies of economic conversion. And what would be more uh, uh, doable and wise than shifting from military spending to a green jobs agenda and an agenda that hires workers, hires workers to rebuild uh, the U.S. Uh, economic uh, infrastructure. Lastly, I would mention my own sort of intrigue about following an, uh, another additional sort of movement formation that's going to grow and expand in the months ahead. The New Poor People's Campaign, launched by Reverend William Barber. And Barber refers back to Dr. King's speech at Riverside Church in 1967, where he talked about the three evils, uh, poverty, militarism, and racism. And what I find really intriguing about the New Poor People's Campaign, which was launched 50 years ago, uh, 1968, uh, shortly before Dr. King himself was assassinated, is that it was a campaign that sought to interconnect all these different issues the domestic and the foreign, the environmental, the question of poverty, the question of racism. And the one optic that I saw uh, last week that really inspires me is that I think this coming week there's going to be a live stream of a conversation between Bernie Sanders and William Barber. And to me that optic of the Sanders campaign and what that campaign stood for in terms of economic justice and Barber's Moral Mondays campaign and what that stood for in terms of building an ethical moral society is a wonderful way to think about how we should envision ourselves moving ahead in all these different dimensions. Thank you.